This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 184, recorded on August 9th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Today, my guest is a pretty recently minted professor here at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Sam Sternberg, welcome to TWIM. Thanks, Vincent. Newly minted, is that a good descriptor? It's, I just had my six-month lab anniversary, so it's, it's been new. just over six months, yeah. And I, I've been here, let's see, it's uh, August and September. I will have been here 36 years. All right. Well, hopefully I'll be sitting on the opposite of the table <laughs> at some point, and I can be having this conversation with the next generation. You, you may not be here for 36 years, but you'll be somewhere. <laughs> I just never left, but some people move all the time, you know, it's just well, how it is. I did my undergrad here, so I'm coming back home and I wouldn't mind staying here for, for some time. Most but we'll likely, see. yeah. So you're an undergrad at Columbia and that means down at uh, the 116th Street campus. Mm -hmm. where, where are you from originally? Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster. Now, what's there that, is there a train there or something like that? Amtrak runs through there, but it's best known for Amish country. Amish country, right. So people That's often right. think, oh, you must be a farmer. You must be <laughs> Amish. I grew up in Lancaster City. It's not a big city, but, uh, but you know, you see Amish at the farmer's market downtown, which is fantastic. Yeah. But the day-to-day -day life, they're, they're out in the countryside. But beautiful farm, beautiful farm country, good city, good place to grow up. Did you get interested in science from a young age? You know, I did science fair projects. My dad was a college professor in geology yeah. and geophysics, but my science fair projects were mostly in the earth sciences, mm. which I think <laughs> as a high school student, middle school student didn't really inspire me. Yeah. So I'd really have to credit Columbia and a couple of classes in my first two years that really got me on the first organic chemistry um, mm -hmm. pursuit. And then from that, I moved more into biochemistry. I remember taking biochem with Brent Stockwell right. and uh, Liang Ton. And love drawing out mechanisms, thinking about molecular <laughs> details of how chemistry happens in the cell. So I think my real passion for research and for science really started in college. And then especially working mm -hmm. with my undergrad advisor, Ruben Gonzalez, that was what kind of told me this is what I want to do in life. What years were you at Columbia? 03 to 07. 03. So I hadn't started teaching my virology course. I think I started the next year. You probably would have taken it. I would have loved to. I I have to confess, I don't know much about eukaryotic virology. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I think phages are pretty cool. We're going to talk about that, I'm sure. But yeah. yeah, I've been, since grad school, cloistered in the worlds of bacteria and bacterial viruses yeah, more than eukaryotic sure, viruses. Sure. Well, we talk a little bit about phages in my course, but since I spent my life working on eukaryotic viruses, that, that's what dominates the course. So you, so you didn't come to Columbia pre-med then? Nope, I was... I didn't really know what I wanted to do, yeah, but I knew cool. probably math or science, something in that area. Flirted a little bit with pre-med at some point, but for me, hmm. I love being in the lab. I love thinking about basic mechanism. I'm happy to be at the medical center now because I think being pushed a little more in the direction of thinking about translational science yeah. is always a good thing. But at the end of the day, I like thinking about how things work in the cell. And so for me, pre-med was never going to kind of satisfy yeah, that curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Where'd you go after here? So I went to UC Berkeley for grad school. I actually teched for, for a year and a half at mm -hmm. Columbia in the same undergrad lab, Ruben Gonzalez. Then I did my PhD at UC Berkeley, and that's where I got into CRISPR before CRISPR was mm -hmm. a huge fad. And then I actually worked at a biotech company for a year after writing a book with Jennifer on the discovery of CRISPR immune systems and the development of gene editing technology using CRISPR. So I had a brief stint as a book author, then as a scientist at a uh, industry, and then mm -hmm. I came back to academia, and I'm exactly where I want to be. So did you go to Berkeley to work with Jennifer, or you, you hadn't? Did, she was probably top two. Yeah. Um, the drama of my grad school beginnings was that I deferred last minute for a year, mm -hmm. and then in that year of deferral, I both found out that she had moved to Genentech to take on a vice president position. Hmm. 
And also that was around the time of the Great Recession and Berkeley happened to be the only state funded university that I had applied to. All the other grad schools I considered and said no to were private Mm -hmm. and California was hit amongst the hardest by that recession. So I got an email from the university having deferred already that they were doing campus-wide 20% budget cuts, Mm -hmm. cutting back Mm -hmm. on staff, custodial staff. So those were kind of a bit of turmoil before I actually started, but then Jennifer ended up resigning from her position before the lab even relocated, came back to yeah. Berkeley. I started, did a rotation in her lab, was convinced that she was happy to stay at Berkeley long-term, and then, yeah, was very happy yeah, spending cool. my PhD in the lab there. I didn't even know that she had gone to Genentech for a while. Yeah, I think it surprised a lot of people. The lab, you know, there were some casualties of that brief move. Some people left the lab because they didn't want to finish their PhD or yeah. do a postdoc at a, a company. But I think, you know, what she told me is she realized, unfortunately, after having taken the job and mm. she herself was already spending four days a week there, but she just realized very quickly it wasn't wasn't actually the place she wanted to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> it certainly benefited the lab to stay in Berkeley because that, yeah. I think, is just a great environment. The building we were in has a lot of structural folks, a lot of people doing biochemistry, molecular biology. So for me as a student, that was a fantastic place to study. What building to study. were you in? Was Gosh, it, it wasn't it uh, Lee Kaching, was it? No, that wasn't there yet. Oh, yeah, okay. um, wow, well, Stanley Hall. Okay. Which used to exist before the new building. It was knocked down before I started, and then the new Stanley Hall was built. But yeah, Lee Kaching, that was going up as I was yeah. doing my studies and a couple other buildings down on that part of campus. So I went out there a couple of years ago to do a, a podcast. They have a student-run symposium every year. I think it's micro department, but I'm not sure. So I came and did a podcast, but... It was in the Lee Kaching building, mm. and we had a dinner. So the labs have terraces, Ugh. and they overlook the bay. The be- we had dinner one night out there. It was just great. And so- someone took me to the museum to show me the T-Rex uh, mm-hmm. skeleton mm-hmm. there, which is just awesome. It's great. You must have gone to see that, of right? Of course. Yeah, the Bay Area view will spoil you forever. I remember coming <laughs> back to New York. And seeing an apartment with a Hudson River view, and it was so unspectacular because compared <laughs> to the Bay Area view, it's just a brown looking river. It's yeah, really, yeah. I mean, now I'd, I enjoy looking at that every time I see it, but, uh, but yeah, the Bay Area is something nice. else. Yeah, it's very nice. So when, when you uh, joined the lab, had CRISPR already been taken into the lab? At that time? So when I joined, my rotation project was actually studying microRNA biogenesis right. uh, by Human Dicer. And at that time, about half the lab was studying RNAi. Um, and CRISPR was um, being pursued by one postdoc and one grad student who had joined a year and a half before I did my rotation. But it was really like an orphan project mm-hmm. that the mm-hmm. lab didn't really care about and most people didn't understand. So it was interesting <laughs> and it appealed to me because compared to RNAi, you could spend one week and read the entire literature on CRISPR. Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally every paper <laughs> on CRISPR, both after it was coined and even all the papers before the term itself was coined, you could read it yeah. all in one week. So for me, that was actually very appealing as a research topic to be in a field where there wasn't a lot of competition. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of mm-hmm. open questions. No one really knew how anything worked beyond the broad strokes. Um, at that point, it was known that these were immune systems, widespread in bacteria and archaea. But in terms of what the molecular components were, how the guide RNA was being used by different proteins, that was a big black box. Yeah. Of course, nowadays you can't read the literature in a week. No. <laughs> nowadays you can spend a week trying to catch up on just like the papers that came out in that week. That's amazing. Yeah. I did uh, a search just for reviews. <laughs> They're so specialized. Some of them are talking about using CRISPR in specific organs, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's just amazing. Or animals or plants. I mean... Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's actually... I struggle nowadays with just staying on top of the literature and deciding which papers should I be reading because, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's just the volume of work coming out now is pretty staggering. Because it's kind of interesting to be at the genesis of a new field. Have you ever thought about that? And... You know, you were at the beginning, really, and now you're seeing it exploding, but it doesn't happen very often, right? Yeah. You hear you hear <laughs> older professors talk about how something began, yeah, and it, yeah. it's it's fun that I can now, we'll be able to talk about CRISPR in that way. Not that I played any significant role in that, um, but, you know, I was at, I think, the second annual CRISPR meeting mm-hmm. ever, and this is the meeting that's still going on every year, but now it's one of 
a few dozen meetings every yeah. year. Yeah. But this is the meeting that began in 2008, <clears throat> focused purely on bacterial and archaeal adaptive immune systems. <laughs> and so, you know, those were the meetings where all the people in the world studying CRISPR were coming to Berkeley. And it was an audience of maybe 30, 40 people. You know, that was yeah. the world's CRISPR community back in those years. Yeah. So when I started as a PhD student, recombinant DNA had been developed, mm. which was mm -hmm. also an enabling technology, right? Um, it was amazing. But we didn't quite realize it at the time, I think, right? It takes time for things to accelerate. And over the years, there have been other cool things. I think PCR was a big one. It's permeated everything. But the cool thing about science is that there'll be something new, right? Absolutely. People just are curious and they'll find new things. I think that's the cool thing about it. I wonder if you could give us a brief history uh, of CRISPR. How did it start and and bring it to the present? You know, it doesn't have to take a long time, but I'm yeah, sure yeah. you can give us an overview. So I often, when I give talks for kind of non-specialist audiences, I always show a screenshot of the first paper describing what we now call a CRISPR. Mm -hmm. That was in 1987. This was back when sequencing genes was an entire publication. So That's they right. were sequencing a gene in E. coli. <laughs> and in the three prime UTR of that gene, they found mm -hmm. a series of direct repeats that were spaced, mm -hmm. you know, in this very kind of array, tandem array where the same 32 nucleotides of spacer DNA was separating each repeat. So that was the first time this feature was described. I had no idea what it was, though, of course. Yeah, so they have this classic <laughs> sentence in, in the in the very end of the paper that the biological significance of these sequences is not mm -hmm. known. And as I comment on in my talks, that was going to be the case for another 20 years. Mm -hmm. Of course, what was different 20 years later is that these had now been found, not the same sequences of repeats, but the same repeat properties, namely direct repeats interspaced with other sequences, those mm -hmm. had been found in about 40% of all bacterial genomes that have been sequenced, something like 90 or 95% of all archaeal genomes. So by the early 2000s, it was appreciated that whatever these were doing, they were extremely widespread. And that's, of course, a great indicator that they must have some important function mm -hmm. because they wouldn't be retained over evolutionary time if they're not doing something critical to the species. Then in 2005 were the first clues about what their actual function might be. And that was the result of three independent papers that found if you ignored the direct repeats and you looked at the sequences of DNA spliced in between the repeats, mm -hmm. those were often perfect matches to either bacterial virus DNA or plasma DNA. So foreign genetic elements that are known to parasitize various mm -hmm. bacterial or archaeal hosts. So that led to the very um, tantalizing speculation that maybe these sequences were being stored in the host genome as a way to serve as some immune system, some sequence feature that would help identify a foreign genetic element as being foreign. So that was still speculation at that point. And then I think the real breakthrough paper that really put CRISPR on the map was a 2007 study from a yogurt company at the time called Danisco. They were studying the bacterium Streptococcus thermophilus, which is the main workhorse bacterium to ferment milk into yogurt, various cheeses. And obviously, they have a, a major interest in developing more virus-resistant strains because those are going to save them a lot of money in the long mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. And they were the first to actually take viral, what are called bacteriophage insensitive mutants. And we should probably mention that bacteriophages is just a a uh, term for bacterial viruses, phage meaning to eat. So they were isolating colonies that were resistant to viruses during experiments where they were infecting them with different viruses. And then they actually did DNA sequencing of the CRISPR part of the genome. And they found that these strains that were acquiring resistance were actually expanding their CRISPR DNA. Mm -hmm. They were splicing new sequences from those viruses that had been infected with into the CRISPR array, and those strains that had new sequences in the CRISPR array were now immune to any phage with a matching mm. sequence. So that was really the first study that proved mm. that these sequences provide adaptive immunity. They didn't remove them, though, and show that they reacquired susceptibility, right? They didn't go that direction, but yeah. they put them in and then infected them. They had one nice experiment where they had two different phages with partial homology, yeah. so they could show that one 
new spacer that was acquired from one phage provided resistance to a different phage that had the same target sequence matching that new spacer. Okay. So this brings up a question that I always had. So you have, these are lytic phages, right? What they were using, yeah. So if infection kills all the bacteria, how do you get some that have this phage DNA incorporated into them? Are there just a few survivors that then go on and be resistant? So in the context of acquiring immunity, they're just putting a little snippet of the phage DNA into the CRISPR array. Yeah. But it's an interesting question because actually one of the discoveries that really shocked the field in 2012, 2011, 2012, I think it was 2012, was published by a friend of mine at UCSF, Joe Bondi Denemy. And he mm-hmm. asked a question, why do some phages escape the CRISPR system? Why can some phages lysogenize a host and go undestroyed? And it turns out that those phages have phage-encoded inhibitors of CRISPR systems or anti-CRISPRs as they're called. So what's been really Hmm. fun being in the field for so long is that you've kind of seen those first discoveries just tell us on a broad level what's going on. But then as the years have advanced, we've learned more and more about all these interesting features of this arms race between bacteria and virus. Okay. All right. So yogurt was the first demonstration that these are probably re- involved in immunity to infections, at least. That's phage right. Phage infections. And I had the the fortune of meeting um, the scientist that coined the term CRISPR. Mm-hmm. So that came out in 2002. But I'd like to mention him. This is Rude Janssen, who's in the Netherlands. Because not only did he coin CRISPR in his paper in 2002, but he also made a really important discovery, which is that these CRISPR arrays are consistently flanked by a core set of conserved genes, which we now call CAS or CRISPR-associated genes. Mm-hmm. So by 2007, it was known not just that these CRISPR arrays have sequences matching virus or matching plasmid, but also that they're probably working together with proteins encoded by genes that always flank the CRISPR array. And so in 2007, that study also showed genetically that some of those genes were required for mm-hmm. this resistance phenotype. Mm-hmm. But it would take another number of years to begin piecing apart what each of those protein products are actually doing. So now we know some of them help process RNA transcripts encoded by the CRISPR array into these guide RNAs. Some of them form targeting complexes. Cas9, of course, is the very famous example, but there Mm -hmm. are actually many other different kinds of targeting complexes using different protein components. And then there's the nearly universally conserved gene called Cas1 which produces an integrase protein that is required for splicing new sequences into the CRISPR, right, mm-hmm, to provide mm-hmm. this adaptive immunity. So the, the immune system is often broken down into three stages. One is integrating new sequences into the CRISPR, array, so splicing in that new sequence during the vaccination stage of the immune system, if you will. Then the second stage is producing the guide RNAs and all the protein products mm-hmm. and assembling the targeting complexes. And then the interference stage is when all these components come together and destroy complementary nucleic acids that would be encountered during a reinfection okay. by that uh, virus. So the realization was that these are both phage or plasmid sequences that get incorporated. Now, as you know, horizontal gene transfer involves plasmid DNAs going from bacterium to bacterium. And that can be good, right? Mm-hmm. So how does the system identify good versus bad plasmid DNA or does, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't really, but you know, it's not a hundred percent effective. So I think, I mean, that's the, the interesting thing from the perspective of the host, you want to yeah. yeah. avoid allowing phages to, to destroy a population, but exactly some, mm. some horizontal gene transfer also by phages can be very beneficial to the host. Okay. So I think it's, it's really a balance of those two. Uh, pros and cons. So why is the, you mentioned Cas9 is the most famous. Why is that? Well, gene editing. Because <laughs> it's been adapted for gene editing. Yeah. I, I, by most famous, I just mean today in biotechnology. Yeah, yeah You sure. often hear CRISPR used synonymously with Cas9. Cas9, sure, sure. And in fact, there are some, you know, sticklers that would say using the term CRISPR for gene editing is actually a misnomer because there's no CRISPR yeah, right. array in <laughs> the right. tool. You're using one protein and a synthetic version of a guide RNA right. that's not a CRISPR either. 
So what I like to point out often is that, you know, Cas9 and the type of CRISPR system it comes from, that's actually one of the less common CRISPR systems that exist in nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, It so happens that, of course, it's extremely effective as a tool because it's a single protein. You can make these single guide RNAs. You can Mm -hmm. transfect Cas9 and the guide RNA very easily into many different cell types. But the biodiversity of CRISPR-Cas systems in bacteria and archaea you know, Cas9 is a minority player. And one of the things that my lab is, is thinking about is all of these other flavors yeah. of CRISPR-Cas systems that could be, you know, potential gold mines for tool development. But I think also coming back to the, the basic research questions, you know, how does how do bacteria use totally different protein and RNA architectures to accomplish the same thing, which is recognizing foreign DNA in a very specific right. fashion right. And, and neutralizing it? Okay, so let's... Cover first how how this works. Let's say we have a bacterium with a CRISPR array, and it's infected by a phage that whose DNA is encoded in that uh, array. How what happens? Are these CRISPR RNAs always made, or are they induced? That's a good question. It depends on the system. Okay. You know, ten years ago, or how many years ago? Yeah, no, eight years ago or so. You know, E. coli was one of the model systems being used to study CRISPR. But in E. coli, lab strains of E. coli, the Cas genes are transcriptionally repressed by a global transcriptional repressor. And E. coli has no functioning CRISPR system, even though the genes are there, the CRISPR array is there. If you Mm -hmm. move those onto plasmids and overexpress them artificially, you can now develop resistance against viruses or plasmids. But for whatever reason, those E. coli strains don't function in their wild type mm. state for immune defense. It's actually a really neat paper from Konstantin Severinov, who's at Rutgers and also has a lab in Russia. They actually sequenced E. coli from a woolly mammoth carcass, <laughs> which had been preserved for <laughs> something like 40,000 years, yeah. and showed that the spacers within the CRISPR array in those E. coli strains were virtually unchanged wow. compared to present day. So that gives you a sense that for whatever reason, that system has no longer functioned as an adaptive immune system in E. coli, but it works if you artificially overexpress it. So there are other systems Mm -hmm. like Streptococcus thermophilus where I think the, I'm sure there's been RNA-seq done, and there I believe these are just being constitutively produced. You're always making guide RNAs, Mm -hmm. you're always making Cas9, so that you have this supply of surveillance complexes that are always patrolling the cell looking for foreign DNA. Got it. So it must be a good fraction of the total transcriptome, right? The the RNAs, yeah. absolutely. And in fact, that was one of the ways that this other type of RNA was discovered, um, which ended up being a critical enabling discovery for mm-hmm. the use of Cas9 for gene editing. Some of your listeners will have heard of tracer RNA. So mm-hmm. in, in some CRISPR systems, there's both the God RNA encoded by the CRISPR array. That's mm-hmm. known as CRISPR RNA. But then there's a trans-activating CRISPR RNA or tracer RNA that's expressed outside of the CRISPR array itself. Mm -hmm. And that was actually detected because if you do RNA-seq on the bug where it came from, Streptococcus pyogenes, the tracer RNA is one of the most abundant Mm. um, small RNAs in that uh, that bacterium. So is the entire array, and I guess these array can be pretty big, right? Mm-hmm. Is the whole thing transcribed as one transcript or multiple transcripts? All transcribed as one transcript. Mm. You generally have lower um, abundance of spacers within mm-hmm. CRISPR RNAs at the far end of the transcript because you can imagine getting RNA polymerase drop off as mm-hmm. you extend down the mm-hmm. array. And that could be beneficial because the neat thing about the integration of new sequences is that that happens directionally. So there's always the newest spacers at one end of the array that are transcribed first. And you can imagine for a bug, you're storing memories from past infections in your CRISPR array. You probably don't care that much about the spacers you got a million generations ago because the likelihood of encountering viruses Mm -hmm. that you encountered a million generations ago is probably (laughs) quite low. You care about having those spacers from the most recent infections at the part of the array that's going to be transcribed first mm-hmm. and have the highest abundance once those RNAs get processed. Do we understand how those newest infections are integrated at that one spot versus the other end, right? So that's that's something that's pretty well understood now. That was, I'd say, the last 
piece of the puzzle to kind yeah. of get filled in in terms of the basic mechanisms of each of those three stages. A friend of mine in Jennifer's lab, who's now also at UCSF as a postdoc, he did some beautiful structural work looking at structures of the integration complex, um, showing how sequences are recognized within the repeat, but then there's also a, a host factor that's involved in bending the DNA in a very characteristic way just upstream of that first repeat mm. that helps um, localize this complex to that first repeat and um, also recognizes the sequences in front of it, which are called the leader sequence. So uh-huh. it's, it's pretty well understood cool. now how you get very targeted integration only at one position within the array. Okay. So we have this long transcript. How long is the transcript? Because it depends on the It can be really right? long and... It, it's very fun gazing at CRISPRs. <laughs> I'll go back to this uh, this Dutch scientist who uh-huh. coined CRISPR. So he actually showed me his notebooks from the late 90s, back before you were doing all of your sequence analysis on a computer. So he had these printouts, uh, you know, it was a fat binder. He had printouts of genomic sequence with all of the repeats highlighted in yellow. Yeah, and yeah. And it's really fun to look at these because of their geometric nature. You have this beautiful kind of periodicity that really – jumps out at you yeah. even without highlighting the repeats if you kind of blur your eyes a little bit you can just see patterns where the same letters are kind of cascading sure. across the page in the sure. same sure. in the same pattern so he uh and some of these arrays are are hundreds of spacers long some are quite short and the shorter ones aren't necessarily any less effective there's thought to be some turnover of old spacers through recombination because you could imagine because these are direct repeats, mm-hmm. they're going to be pretty good at recombining. So the idea is that probably there's some um, equilibrium between acquiring new spacers over mm-hmm. evolutionary time, losing old spacers through recombination. Right. Cool. But the idea is, yeah, you get transcription across the entire array. Mm-hmm. And then there are dedicated ribonucleases that will recognize sequences within the repeat portion and um, introduce a, a cut in the RNA so that from this long single transcript, you get a library of short, mature CRISPR RNAs. Okay. And so those then, or some of those will recognize, say, our incoming phage. Mm-hmm. And what's the sequence of events? What happens next? Does that uh, CRISPR RNA hybridize? Does it bind something else? What happens? So part of my PhD research was understanding this process of target search. Mm-hmm. How do these proteins sift through the vast expanse of not only potential incoming phage DNA, but they're not going to be able to discriminate a priori against phage DNA or genomic DNA. So Mm -hmm. they've got to look through, you know, megabases of DNA looking for that one target. Um, So we did a bunch of work trying to understand how they can pare down the search complexity of the genome and this sequence motif called PAM or protospacer adjacent motif. Um, It's a short, two to five or six letter code, depending Mm -hmm. on which Cas9 or which targeting complex you're studying. But these are used as kind of a hotspot so that you only invest energy looking for complementarity in the DNA Mm -hmm. if there's this short motif flanking the DNA sequence. So basically these these complexes pop around using just three-dimensional diffusion. Every time they hit a PAM, they start unwinding the DNA a little bit looking for a potential match. Mm -hmm. And um, at a cognate sequence, the DNA can be fully unwound. And then there's some proofreading checkpoints that avoid premature cleavage of the target DNA unless it's really the right match. And then in the case of Cas9, it makes um, a double strand break by cleaving both strands using two different nuclease domains. But again, I think it's it's fun to point out that that's one way that CRISPR systems target DNA. Mm. There are other enzymes that cleave DNA in a completely different way. Instead of making one double strand break, they actually unwind and processively cleave at many positions using a a protein that's a heel case and a nuclease Mm -hmm. all in Mm -hmm. one. And then there are whole types of CRISPR systems that don't target RNA uh, DNA at all. They target RNA. RNA, Right. So there's actually, again, this (laughs) vast diversity of different ways that different systems have, you know, evolved to use the same guide RNA hallmark feature, but use it to recognize foreign genetic elements in totally different ways. And there are probably more that we haven't found. Yeah. That's why why you want to keep looking. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the CRISPR RNA, this this searching, does that happen together with Cas9? It's already attached via the 
tracer yep. RNA, right? So tracer RNA, CRISPR, and how is that? How are those RNAs brought to Cas9? That's not super well understood. Mm. Um, presumably, yeah, Cas9 just bumps into CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA. Those um, are already hybridized, so, so those have a large um, region of complementarity. Yeah, yeah. So the tracer RNA, the CRISPR RNA can hybridize through the stem that forms between them. And that's actually critical for the processing of those long transcripts. So in, mm-hmm. in the type two system with that use Cas9, there's a different kind of uh, okay. processing mechanism that relies on tracer RNA and CRISPR RNA hybridizing. So those hybridize, that leads to cleavage by a, a host factor called RNase3. Mm-hmm. And then you have the right substrate for Cas9 to bind to, and it has sequence specificity for that particular type of hybrid right. RNA. Right. Um, so that's thought to just, and, and, and one of the other things is because you have the Cas genes like mm-hmm. Cas9 directly flanking the CRISPR array, you could imagine that you're getting localized transcription of the CRISPR array, transcription and translation mm-hmm. of the proteins. Mm-hmm. So these are probably all spatially confined. And so you have a much higher probability of these things okay. interacting with each other. So in an uninfected cell, these are being made Unless you're E. coli, in which case, you know, right. But so why don't they cleave genomic DNA? Because they have the CRISPR arrays in there. Right? So that's that's another part where the PAM-guided target search mm-hmm. becomes key. Because the CRISPR array has the spacers, which, as you rightly pointed out, are a perfect match to the guide RNA because that's where they're encoded. But the sequence flanking the spacer in the CRISPR array does not have a PAM. And so that's an immediate way that Cas9 will always exclude the CRISPR array itself as a potential target because the absence of a PAM means it's not even going to ever look Mm -hmm. for a potential match there. So the PAM is really the first requirement that even allows it to begin melting open the DNA. And so we think that actually probably evolved as a requirement to avoid self-targeting, which any immune system needs to be able to do, avoid self and discriminate between self and Mm non-self. And then it also serves as a way to reduce search complexity because instead of having to pry apart the DNA helix, double helix, every time you bind, you just invest that energy when you're at a PAM, which represents a potential target site. Okay. Now, the Cas9 is not active unless these RNAs are bound to it, right? Do we understand how the binding triggers activation? In terms of, I guess it's DNA activation would be. Did you read my papers? I feel like you're asking me questions that are. I did. (laughs) Looked over all of them. Looked. I didn't read every one, but I I looked at them. I'm now realizing like these questions are a little bit targeted towards some of the work I've done. But for our listeners, it's a good way for them to focus on because you you've touched on a lot of things that that impact the entire field. So. And anyway, it's your interview, so we can can do this. (laughs) Because I I actually love talking about the CRISPR things that I mean. I'm trying to expand beyond because yeah, my, my PhD was you know, also focused on very nitty-gritty mechanistic questions that I think what I liked about these projects is you know, understanding target search is interesting as a mm. basic research question, but that actually becomes critical when thinking about how to use this tool and avoid off-target effects. Right. And that's another reason why on the most recent question, we were very interested in understanding why does Cas9 not cut DNA sequences that it has a high degree of binding affinity for? Mm -hmm. Because we know from a variety of experiments, including work that was done by a new professor starting this fall, who was one of the first to do chip-seq on um, mammalian cells expressing Cas9 and guide Mm -hmm. RNA. And he found that actually Cas9 will pull down a lot of mismatched DNA sequences Mm -hmm. that have very limited homology to the guide RNA. So that really begs the question, why is Cas9, and and if you do a Venn diagram comparing sites that it binds to and sites that it introduces double-strand breaks in, Mm -hmm. it's much, much more promiscuous in binding than it is in cutting. So that really begs the question, how does this protein have greater... DNA cleavage specificity than the binding specificity, which right. is actually quite low. Um, and there were some very interesting clues from the first crystal structures that came out. So being in Jennifer's lab, I didn't actually do any structural biology myself. I did in collaboration, but, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about how structures could tell us about mechanism. And in fact, if you looked at those first structures, the nuclease domains of Cas9, which actually cut the DNA, mm-hmm. were bizarrely mispositioned 
they were very far away from the actual cut site on the DNA. And there wasn't a clear explanation why <laughs> they were out of place. But my hypothesis was maybe the positioning of the cutting domains is actually being controlled to improve the specificity beyond binding so that you might initially bind DNA in some inactive state mm -hmm. and only with sufficient complementarity would these domains undergo some conformational change mm -hmm. that would then mm -hmm. trigger cleavage. And so that's um, exactly what it turns out to, to happen. And we did some fluorescence-based experiments to show that there is this conformational control. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you now look at a number of the papers that have been published on higher fidelity Cas9 variants, again, we're now in technology space where people care about off-target editing yeah, and right. um, have been using kind of a variety of methods to look at off-target effects and then use directed evolution or rational engineering to make higher fidelity variants. We published a paper last year where we used this knowledge about conformational control to build a higher fidelity version and there were two other studies that didn't have access to that mechanism yet because we hadn't published our paper. But if you now look at where their mutations are found, it actually make, it works together beautifully with our conformational mm. control study because those are directly in those positions that would affect this conformational equilibrium that we think Cas9 has evolved to control. So what is the extent of base pairing between the, the RNA and the DNA? How many bases so is that? So it's 20 base pairs in total. Okay. And, you know, we actually focused on a small number of model mismatch substrates mm -hmm. and show that, you know, if you have like 17 out of 20 that are correct, that's kind of the right when you cross over between undergoing this conformational change okay. and cleaving or not cleaving. And that's actually matches well with other off-target studies. But this has obviously been done in a much more high throughput scale with some of the mm -hmm. um, studies looking at editing efficiency. So three bases mismatch is enough for it hit somewhere else to say you're doing gene editing it could hit somewhere else in the genome which would be bad right so you'd like to get around that obviously yeah and right. i would say for gene editing you'd like it to be able to discriminate one base pair mismatch too i mean if you're talking about using this mm. therapeutically you know you really want it to be as close to perfect as possible and some of these higher fidelity variants have mm -hmm. improved the specificity where in many cases it can discriminate just a single base pair mismatch um which is really important if you're going to, you know, move this into the clinic. So it will, you can't get a hundred percent fidelity. In other words, it will only recognize a hundred percent of those 20 base pairs, base paired. Is, is that possible? There are, I would say depending on the target sequence, there are some targets where people have looked and found zero off target effect mm -hmm. cleavages elsewhere in the genome. And, you know, some of the algorithms now for choosing guides if you can choose a guy that has very few similar sequences elsewhere in the genome, then you may not even have any off-target potentials that are just different by one base pair. So I think right. it's a combination of just bioinformatic uh, predictions of how many sequences are similar and then doing the experiments to look in an unbiased fashion if you get any edits at off-target effects. And there are a number of studies now right. on how you can do this unbiased uh, analysis. Let's talk a little bit about the finding. You mentioned that you know diffusion uh, governs the ability of the Cas RNA complex to find its target. So, what, what's the time scale that we're talking about? Because especially a eukaryotic genome, but even a, a archaeal or bacterial genome is pretty big. Are we talking about milliseconds to scan the entire genome, or longer? More like hours. Hours. Yeah. Well, sorry, hours for a single Cas9. And oh, there that, may, there's probably more than one. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, for it to be effective against a phage, you need to do it probably in about 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, the reason hours was in my head is because there's now <laughs> been some studies looking at search kinetics using mm -hmm. fluorescently labeled versions of Cas9 in E. coli. People have also looked at target search in mammalian cells mm -hmm. and the results of the study in E. coli found that for a single Cas9, it takes somewhere on the scale of, I think, a couple hours, mm. which isn't obviously a relevant yeah. number yeah. because E. coli is dividing many times in those two couple hours. But um, obviously the time to find a target is going to depend not just on search time per molecule, but how many molecules are sure. undergoing the sure. search. And that also comes back to how big is the CRISPR array and how many different – 
guide RNAs yeah, yeah. Are, are soaking up Cas9s because now you've got to you know you've got to look at what population of Cas9s have the guide RNA mm-hmm. that match the incoming phage. Okay, so what is actually happening? The RNA protein complex is it actually scanning the entire DNA base by base? Do you think it's just diffusing three dimensionally? We so I came to Columbia during my PhD to work with a professor named Eric Green mm-hmm. to use single molecule fluorescence microscopy, looking for scanning. We thought maybe these use one dimensional diffusions that they might kind of bump into the DNA and then slide uh-huh. one dimensionally along the DNA double helix, and that might be a way that they right. accelerate search time. And we didn't actually find any evidence for those one um, hmm. D diffusion dynamics. So we think it's mostly popping on and off DNA through mm-hmm. random collisions, and you just need enough cast iron molecules right. and enough time to happen to find the right spot. It's amazing. <laughs> that that works because you think, yeah, if you're searching through a megabase per genome or now talk about a human cell that's mm-hmm. got a gigabase per genome, for this to actually work, is it's kind of amazing. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Let's get, do that after we talk a little bit about gene editing. Because we got chromatin there and everything, right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't that's know how another, that, right? yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So it's bumping randomly. There are lots of Cas9 RNA complexes. Eventually, it sees some complementarity. The PAM is there, and that triggers conformational change, double-stranded DNA break in the case of Cas9, and that, that wrecks the virus, basically. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, although, you know, one thing we found um, many years ago is that unsuspectingly, Cas9 stays bound to the cleave DNA Mm. in in a test tube experiment for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And this has now been shown um, in by a bunch of other labs. And in fact, a paper just came out recently showing that in gene editing experiments, you can accelerate the editing efficiency if you have your target in an actively transcribed region, because rather than Cas9 staying bound, if RNA polymerase, pole 2 knocks it off the DNA. Mm-hmm. That can actually affect repair yeah, sure. in a way that you can imagine now you've exposed the double-strand break to host factors, and the quicker Cas9 gets ripped off, the faster that you might have yeah, good point. You know, repair factors coming to the DNA. So I've always actually wondered what's the, what's the relevance of Cas9 staying bound to cleave DNA in the context of a phage infection? Because mm-hmm. it's not clear to me that it'd be beneficial to cut the DNA, but then hold on to that DNA. And I always thought maybe if you don't protect that double strand break, maybe the phages can recombine. Sure. If you have a multiplicity sure. of infection above one and you just yeah. repair that double strand break with a neighboring phage genome. Whereas if you hold on to it until a DNA polymerase comes along and now you get mm. some messed up replication fork because you got a double strand break, maybe that's actually better than just cutting once letting go and giving the cell the chance to homologously recombine two different phages. Yeah, it makes genomes. sense to me because, yeah, you're right. Recombination could fix it Yeah, for sure. But, yeah, so we think hmm. it cuts and then it may stay bound. And okay. at some point that phage genome can't be properly replicated anymore and Got that's it. sufficient to, to ablate the infection. All right. So let's talk now about how you modify this for gene editing. All right, that was, was that done while you were there in the, in the Doudna laboratory? Yep. So, um, so I actually didn't start working on Cas9 until um, after Martin Yinek, who was a postdoc mm-hmm. at the time, uh, started this collaboration with Emmanuel Charpentier. Mm-hmm. She was um, the one whose lab had discovered tracer RNA. Okay. And, um, you know, we write about in the book how her and Jennifer met each other and then they started a collaboration to try to understand the molecular mechanism of DNA targeting by mm-hmm. Cas9. Back then, Cas9 was actually called CSN1, mm-hmm. so it underwent a name change around 2011, 2012. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. <laughs> That's what I think of. <laughs> I, don't know you if, know, and, I don't know if you remember them, but they're, they're... I know who they are, <laughs> of course. Um, and actually, Cas9, before it was CSN1, was Cas5. So that yogurt uh-huh. paper from 2007 has very clear evidence that if you inactivate the Cas5 gene, uh-huh. you lose adaptive immunity and Cas5 is today's Cas9. Cas9. Okay. So Martin was the one that was working with Christoph Kylinski, a PhD student in Emmanuel's lab to purify Cas9, understand how it interacts with CRISPR RNA and trace RNA. Mm-hmm. 
you know, there was good genetic evidence at the time that Cas9 might be the DNA cleaving enzyme. And in hindsight, it seems obvious that it would bind CRISPR RNA and trace RNA and mm-hmm. cut DNA. But at the time, I mean, the pieces just weren't all there to put that together. So you really needed to do these experiments to show this is actually what's happening. So um, he was pursuing this in Jennifer's lab together with Christoph and Emmanuel's lab. They showed that indeed Cas9 uses two distinct nuclease domains to cut both strands of DNA and that this absolutely required both CRISPR RNA and the trace RNA. And so um, around that time, I had already set up a collaboration to look at this target search question, but actually using a different CRISPR complex called Mm -hmm. Cascade, which is the one found in E. coli, and it's the one that's much more prevalent across bacterial and archaeal genomes. But around the time of Martin's project, coming to a conclusion, I thought, A, this might become a big tool. So I think we should think about what importance that might have in terms of like, you know, just going after systems that are not only interesting biologically, but have potential biotechnology utility. And then also we thought it would be cool to look at target search across two completely distinct evolutionarily unrelated protein architectures. And in fact, Mm -hmm. we ended up publishing two papers and showed that they had converged on very similar modes of target search even though there's no ancestral relationship between them whatsoever. So, yeah, so it it wasn't, I wasn't involved in the project to first show that Cas9 uses these two RNAs to make double strand breaks, but that was going on in the lab. And I just had a conversation this morning where I was recounting signing Martin's notebook pages when Mm. this, uh, when he first um, invented this idea of the single guide RNA by fusing CRISPR Mm -hmm. RNA and trace RNA into a single transcript to turn what would have been a three-component system into just two components, the Cas9 and the fused single-guide RNA. It just makes it easier for people to target, right? Just one less component you have to encode in a a plasmid that you might be transfecting. And so now the the tracer is invariant. It's always going to be the same. And then the CRISPR part is going to be whatever gene you want to target. Exactly. And these, these vectors are designed so that you can easily clone oligos into them 20 mers basically to, to put in whatever guide sequence you was want. It, was that first tested in, in a bacterium? So in the paper that Jennifer and Emmanuel published, they showed um, in 2012 that you could target any arbitrary site on a plasmid in a biochemical cleavage experiment. Mm-hmm. And then obviously there's a little bit of drama over which research group really invented the technology, but in at least in the publication record in 2013, there were back-to-back papers from Feng Zhang's lab at MIT mm-hmm. Broad Institute and George Church's lab at Harvard showing that, indeed, if you expressed Cas9 and these guide RNAs in uh, either human cell lines or uh, murine cell lines, okay. you could you know, introduce permanent edits into genes of interest. I guess that's one of these leap of faith experiments, right? Because not only, as you said before, the eukaryotic genome is so much bigger – but it's chromatinized, it's all wrapped up. I mean, that's the thing. If you think about it too much, you'd never do the experiment. Ah, it's not going to work, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it seems to work so darn well, too. I mean, it's amazing. Even yeah. with all that protein there. We don't understand how, right? Because there's no chromatin in bacteria, for sure. Well, there there are structures. I mean, yeah. there are histone-like proteins that compact mm. the DNA in different ways. But, yeah, certainly not. It's amazing, yeah. These well-formed nucleosomes that you think pr- would present some obstacle to Cas9. So explain uh, how we have now this this uh, complex, to Cas9, which is making a double-strand break. How does that make it possible to do gene editing? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I wish I could go back in time and <laughs> read more about gene editing before I joined Jennifer's lab because I'd like to think I would have been working on Cas9 three years before everyone else was. <laughs> Um, but the truth is, you know, I joined Jennifer's lab being interested in RNA protein biology. So I wasn't really personally on top of the decades long field to yeah. develop different ways of doing gene targeting. Although it's nicely summarized in your book. Yeah. Right. I, I spent a lot of time after the fact <laughs> reading about it, but yes. unfortunately it came a little bit too late, <laughs> but yeah, you know, people have been trying to develop ways of introducing breaks at particular sites in the genome for a long time, in part because of work from Rodney Rothstein, which showed in the 1970s that double-strand breaks are the trigger for doing homologous recombination. 
And so, and it was Maria Jason who showed in the 90s that um, if you introduced artificial nucleases, they were using a homing endonuclease from yeast. If you express that in mammalian cells and introduced a specific double strand break, the rates of homologous recombination at that site went up by orders of magnitude. So ever since that discovery, there's been this idea that if you can develop programmable nucleases, so nucleases that you can easily redesign to cleave any sequence of interest, that would be a powerful way to introduce permanent edits because of eukaryotic cells' abilities to take breaks and either seal them back up, usually with some insertion or deletions that Mm -hmm. can be sufficient to knock out a gene of interest, or combined with a repair template, actually introduce a precise change that the experimentalist can design. So, you know, I think it's always important to stress that CRISPR is not the first gene editing technology. And, you know, one sad part of the book is we ended up, I think, spending one paragraph or a couple paragraphs talking about talons, Mm. which I think would have revolutionized gene editing in a far more permanent way if CRISPR hadn't come along and kind of taken the wind out of their sails and become an even easier technology because it uses an RNA molecule for the specificity. But the previous technologies, which are called ZFNs and talons, those use uh, redesigned DNA binding domains, protein-based DNA binding mm-hmm. domains, which <laughs> can be re-engineered, but they're just a pain to work with because yeah, yeah. they're not perfect. The cloning can be a real pain, especially for talons. Um, and if you had to invent from first principles the way that you would target different DNA sequences at will, it'd be ideal to just use base pairing because nucleic acids already have a way to recognize each other through hydrogen bonding. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that CRISPRs are doing exactly that. And with the work on Cas9, it became apparent that you can just have the guide RNA sequence match the DNA sequence you want to make a break in, and it just works amazingly. So let's see. Let me give you a couple of uh, case situations. Let's say you want to completely delete a gene from a cell line. What, what would you do? Like what in terms of designing the Cas9? We'll, we'll take for granted is in there. What kind of uh, RNAs would you design? So now you can use. It's very easy to use paired guide RNAs, where mm-hmm. you can have guide RNAs targeting the the regions flanking the gene you want to literally excise. And in some proportion of cells, you'll have that entire region just be lost because you'll have, you know, concurrent cutting at both positions. And, you know, it's important that you'll have a a variety of different repair outcomes. And I think some of the recent literature is highlighting the fact that Mm. you get a variety of different repairs. And in some cases, even at the target site, you can get large deletions that could be a major problem for for therapeutic development. And some of the methods that researchers have been using to assess repairs impose a bias because if you do, let's say, PCR amplicon sequencing Mm. across the site you're cleaving or or introducing an edit in, you're not going to even see large deletions. So so now with new (laughs) methods, we're seeing that actually we don't have as good of a handle on all the different types of outcomes as are possible. A number of labs have shown that you can use two guide RNAs and two mm-hmm. cuts to excise entire regions. Um, that's been that's been very powerful. It's a maximum number of guide RNAs you could put in a cell. Do we know? Can you put more than two? Oh, absolutely. Um, there was a study earlier this year from um, Joanna Wysocka at Stanford. They developed a tool called CARGO. I forget what the acronym stands for, but they cloned tandem arrays of guide RNAs, each one downstream of a U6 promoter. And they were interested in increasing the signal to noise um, Mm -hmm. if you were doing chromosomal locus imaging. Because if you, let's say you you want to image specific regions of the genome, a single Cas9 GFP fusion. So people have done this, um, for example, using a Cas9 GFP fusions. If you use a guide RNA targeting a sequence in telomeric DNA, Obviously, you have those are highly repetitive, so you get these beautiful foci labeling all of the telomeres of all the chromosomes. Mm-hmm. But for non-repetitive target sites, it's been a limitation to get how do you get enough signal to noise, and they showed that you can actually build these plasmids with 
tandem arrays of dozens of guides hmm. as a way to tile Cas9 along the region of interest. So that instead of one binding event, you get a few dozen Cas9s coming along with GFP or yeah, other cool. types of cargo. Amazing. Now, if you wanted to replace an allele, what would you do? So there you're going to combine Cas9 with donor templates. Mm-hmm. And people are experimenting with different ways to deliver donor templates. Recombinant AAV is one of the most, um, leads to some of the most efficient homologous recombination. Um, you can also put in single-stranded DNAs. There are now some companies that sell very long single-stranded DNAs. If you want to knock in some uh, reporter or some epitope tag, um, you can also transfect uh, double-stranded DNA or plasmid-based donor templates, although the efficiencies mm-hmm. are often mm-hmm. quite a bit lower. But yeah, those are going to involve Cas9, your guide RNA, and then some type of donor template that carries the sequence you want to introduce. So in all cases, as you alluded to before, you have to check the cells you're working with, especially if you have therapeutic uses in mind. Make sure you got exactly what you intend and not anything else, right? And that's not easy. Yep. So it's both what exactly is at the on-target site and then also looking for off-target edits. And then you also have to worry about other ways that your editing experiment might be imposing some selective pressure on the cells. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of papers a few months ago looking at the potential risk that you might be enriching for P53 mutations right. because right. Um, stem cells in particular. Yeah. Right? Cause yeah. those are going to be better Yeah, at the P50, you basically select for P53 null yeah. cells. Yeah. And right. again, in a therapeutic setting, that's going to be a major problem. Potentially. Yeah, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that because P53 obviously recognizes double stranded, DNA breaks, which are being made by Cas9. And that the one paper I saw said that this is why efficiency of editing in stem cells is low because of P53. And, you, and as you said, you select for either null cells or with mutations. And, and that wouldn't be good because you need, you know, most, most human tumors have mutations in P53. You don't want to use a cell-based therapy that have no. mutations in P53. No. So is that a deal breaker or are people going to figure out what to do there? I don't think it's a deal breaker. I mean, it's interesting because you see, it's interesting to watch the stock market because now there are three (laughs) companies that are publicly traded that are pursuing CRISPR-based therapies. Mm -hmm. And I've never really cared that much about the stock market, but now I I tend to look at those every once in a while just to see how investors respond. And so each time one of these studies comes out, casting some negative light around CRISPR, even though these are solvable problems, or these are, you know, things that the field is already aware of. You often see that, like, the day that those papers come out, the stocks tank 15, yeah, sure. 20%. I think there's a certain amount of hype surrounding CRISPR as a potential therapeutic strategy. And the truth is it's going to be way harder than the media often suggests to turn these into drugs that will actually be effective. And that's both challenges around controlling the types of repairs you get. But, you know, I think delivery is going to still be a massive hurdle the Mm. same way that it has been for gene therapy. Sure. So it's easy to say that this will be a a panacea for, for genetic disease or for cancer, but it's, it's always going to be much more difficult than I think you're going to write about in those first flashy news stories. Oh, when the stocks go down, it's a good time to buy, you know, (laughs) (laughs) because they will always go back up. Uh, Can we talk about some things that you're interested in doing in your lab? I I don't want to have you to say things that, (laughs) You don't want to. I was recently at a interviewing someone and I asked him, he said, no, I can't talk about anything because it's all tied up in companies. <laughs> but you mentioned uh, earlier that you're interested in some of these other. So we haven't touched on this much, but not everything is Cas9, right? They're, CRISPR systems are divided into several types now, right? Mm-hmm. There are several subtypes. And so there are hundreds and maybe more. Are, are any of those being exploited? Are you interested in, in doing that? Yeah. Um to what end? I was about to joke that I <laughs> wouldn't have the problem of the whole company ties, uh-huh. but in fact, there is some work that I did at Caribou that, uh, yeah, I probably sh- there are things I could talk about, but I probably shouldn't just because I, I'm always a little paranoid yeah, about what okay. I should or shouldn't say. But yeah. but I think the point is there are going to be other types of CRISPR systems that will be quite useful, mm-hmm. I think, and that are have been thus far mostly untapped. Um, And we've already seen that from the literature. I mean, now the so-called type 5 systems, which encode a protein called Cas12, Mm -hmm. that turns out to be very uh, efficient for gene editing applications. Uh, 
there's now a lot of excitement around a protein called Cas13, which um, is an RNA guided RNA targeting nuclease. So I think we still don't understand very well what types of RNAs it's targeting endogenously in, in native systems because actually we don't know of that many RNA mm -hmm. phages. So whether or not it's targeting RNA phages or maybe targeting transcripts during – oh, do you have a book on RNA phages? Oh, wow. I just have to show you this because this is an old, this is an old book. It's published in 1975. But it's edited by Norton Zinder, who uh, the first he discovered RNA phages at Rockefeller, and this is some, they're, they're not a lot, but you, they're they're there. You've yeah. just now made me nervous all of a sudden that I, I forgot <laughs> where I am and who I'm talking <laughs> no, to. No, and it's okay, <laughs> it's okay. Um, why would you? Would there be an application for for t cleaving RNA instead of DNA? So there, there's been a couple high profile papers that have tried to address exactly that question. Mm. One is. Um, you know, maybe it'll be a more effective way of doing knockdowns, transient knockdowns, than RNA interference. Mm -hmm. Sure. So some recent studies have kind of compared Cas13-based RNA knockdowns to RNAi, and it seems to be more specific. Hmm. Um, and that's based on doing RNA-seq and, and showing that you have far fewer um, transcript, off-target transcripts that get knocked right. down. Right. It also has the advantage of being completely orthogonal. You're not relying on host machinery in the way that if you transfect Right. SHRNAs, you're right. kind of relying on argonaut yeah, and, and cool. you know, that can actually perturb pathways that you don't want to be touching, whereas here you have a completely orthogonal nuclease and guide RNA. Then in a couple of the studies, they fused Cas13 to adenosine deaminases mm -hmm. so that you can actually do base editing at the RNA level. I'm not as clear where that would be therapeutically useful, but I think, again, as a research tool, you might want to make changes to the transcriptome that aren't permanent. So they're not at the right. DNA level. They're more transient. And cool. that might be a different way of studying various aspects of RNA biology. And then um, there's a really neat application that is actually outside of the cell where Cas13 has been harnessed as a different way of doing viral RNA diagnostics. Right. That's a little bit complicated to explain, but it relies on the fact that Cas13 is a very interesting enzyme it both targets RNA in a sequence-specific fashion, mm -hmm. but it also um, becomes a nonspecific nuclease once it's triggered by binding to the target RNA. Right. Meaning, you know, right. and this is actually one of the theories be behind how this immune system works, is that instead of cutting only the RNA that you're targeting, mm -hmm. maybe um, you actually kill off the cell or induce some dormancy by becoming activated and now cleaving non-specifically any neighboring RNAs in the right, pool right. as a way to, to halt gene expression more globally. I had a name for that. So it's Sherlock is one of the names for it, the, uh, the, for the technology. For the, no, cleaving neighbor, any RNA that happens to be nearby. Oh, have, collateral damage. Collateral damage, yeah. that's right. Yeah, there's a couple of papers in science recently that... With, That's right. With different acronyms. Yeah, yeah. We did so, those on TWIV, right? Oh, cool. <laughs> Took us a long time to read them. So I, I think it's another <laughs> neat example of how, you know, you needed really fundamental mechanistic work to sure. uncover how these enzymes work. And Very I think cool. one study from that a friend of mine published in Jennifer's lab, Mitch O'Connell, who's starting his lab at Rochester, um, he showed how this collateral damage works and that you can actually link that collateral damage to cleaving a fluorescent reporter molecule so right. that you can actually use targeting and read it out through fluorescence. And then Feng Zhang's lab developed that into a technology they called Sherlock, mm -hmm. where you can actually get very, very high sensitivity detection of a target RNA of interest in various clinical samples like blood samples. Um, and now they've recently turned that into kind of a, a I forget what they call it, a dip strip or... Um, yeah, yeah. Similar to like a pregnancy test yeah, where you can actually right. run your sample across some yep. filter paper and turn on a band if your RNA is present in that right. sample. Yeah, it's very cool. So now <laughs> and now there's a, a company that's been founded out of Berkeley um, that a couple of friends of mine are involved with called Mammoth Biosciences. Mm -hmm. And they're hoping to develop this into kind of a point of care card or credit card size diagnostic device that you might be able to use at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially with urine or saliva sample and and be able to detect the presence of pathogenic RNA or DNA 
before you go to the doctor's office, Could for example. Could be that diagnostics come online before gene editing, right? Yeah, there's some people that think that maybe getting things out into consumers' hands might, you know, might yeah. be faster. Clinical trials Could take be. a long time and I think the the safety concerns are much higher than if you're just spitting yeah. on a spitting on a piece of paper. So is mammoth a play on caribou? No. <laughs> um my understanding, because I talked to one of the C level execs a year ago or so, I think it was kind of a play on George Church's work on editing elephant DNA I see. to I see. be more like woolly mammoth DNA. I think yeah. it was roughly a play on that, but it is funny that now you have two yeah. <laughs> two companies that Jennifer's involved with that have kind of random animal names. Yeah, yeah, right. So I guess we need to found another company and call it, <laughs> I don't know, what would the next animal be? Well, you, Something you, else in the- These are pretty big mammals we're talking yeah. about here. So mammoth is uh, is pretty is ancient, right? Caribou is still around. I don't know. You, Moose. You, Moose. You could pick your favorite one. I don't know where where caribou came from. Do you know? Caribou is a portmanteau of ah. Cass, but the S is gone. So CRISPR associated. Right. Ribo for ribonuclease. And then I guess Rachel threw on a U to make it cool. a real animal name. Nice. I didn't know that. So yeah, caribou, we have herd meetings is our <laughs> weekly company-wide meeting. <laughs> we have um, what other kind of caribou-themed uh, the in-house um, computational software is called Tundra. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there were a couple other uh, cute little terms that played on the, the caribou theme. Actually, we did a white elephant exchange a couple years ago, and the gift I got was a, an, a book about caribou, the animals, mm. which I never read. But at some point I will. So you, after you did your, your PhD at Berkeley, you went to caribou. Is that right? Uh, I, read, I wrote this book with Jennifer. First you wrote a book. Yeah. And that took how long? Uh, a year and a month or so. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I read that uh, a couple of months ago, I guess in preparation to uh, – well, you had come by earlier this year and told me about it, so I, I bought it and read it. And uh, it only took a couple of hours, a crack in creation. Probably took you longer to write it, right? It did, yeah. Now, why, why did you decide to do that? I'm curious. You know, I um, I used to read The New Yorker religiously, mm. and I I love science writing for non-specialists. I love science nonfiction. I remember reading um, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins as sure. an undergrad, and it kind of really opened my eyes both to evolutionary biology, but also kind of top quality science writing. And I guess it was never a dream of mine to Hmm. to be a science writer myself, at least outside of the the kind of scientific, formal scientific literature. But I think as CRISPR technology was beginning to crest and it became clear that this was going to really change the way everyone thinks about doing science and doing genetic engineering, having started in the lab when CRISPR was such a small field hmm. and seeing this kind of transition of bacterial adaptive immunity into this blockbuster technology. I thought there aren't that many people that have been on both sides of that. Mm. And, you know, I think the, the long-term ramifications are potentially huge when you start thinking about not just therapeutics in patients with disease, but some of these very controversial ideas surrounding the use of CRISPR in the human germline. So the, the the fact that one could, and in fact scientists have already begun experiments putting CRISPR into human embryos to make genetic changes that could actually make their way through development to a new life. Mm -hmm. And that this could really change the way that we think about genetics and childbearing and what genetic state our children will grow up with. So I think all of these ideas were swirling in my head and um, I remember a vacation I took with my family where I thought, man, someone should write a book or a New Yorker story about CRISPR. And so over the course of about a year, I'd kind of joked with Jennifer here and there about writing a, a piece for the New Yorker mm -hmm. or you should save your memories because someday you'll write it in your own memoir. And then at some point she was contacted by a book agent who's based mm -hmm. in New York, uh, Max Brockman. And she forwarded it to me and said, hey, you're graduating at the end of the year. Do you want to work on this together? And I said, mm. absolutely. 
cool. So you stayed at Berkeley and did this? I traveled a bit. Um, I'd say the first six months of writing were not nearly as productive as the last six months. And the timing of this also happened, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was burnt out, but I worked pretty hard during grad school. And in particular, this, this last paper, first author paper that I published on the conformational activation of Cas9, mm-hmm. I worked on that up until pretty much the day I left. We submitted the paper shortly before I left the lab and I think I just needed a breather. So I did some traveling for a few months and kind of worked on the road, but mm-hmm. I would say wasn't the most productive phase, but I just needed to be out of the lab, be mm-hmm. out of Berkeley and just clear my head. And I think what better way to do that than reading books to try to put CRISPR in a bigger mm-hmm. landscape, thinking about gene targeting, thinking about ZFNs and talons, thinking about the recombinant DNA revolution thinking about the origins of DNA as the genetic material. One of my favorite books ever, probably in the scientific nonfiction literature, is The Eighth Day of Creation, which, yep, okay, it's on your bookshelf. Purple right there. (laughs) Um, I think that was such a fantastic read. Um, Really opened my eyes to thinking Mm -hmm. about how to teach about the origins of of some of these landmark Mm -hmm. discoveries. And I think the, A Crack in Creation didn't end up becoming the kind of book that maybe I imagined it would be when we started the project. That was definitely affected by the timeline. I mean, one year it just wasn't enough time to mm. do these kind of um, interviews that I wanted to do. I mean, when I met this guy in the Netherlands who coined CRISPR, that was when I thought there might be time to go and interview all of the pioneers in the CRISPR field. I thought I could go interview all the pioneers in the gene targeting field. And a few minutes then it became clear if we're going to make this kind of aggressive deadline that's a year from now, there's just no way that's going to happen. But um, interestingly, the first – so the title we came up with when we sent out the book proposal was Rewriting the Code of Life, which Michael Spector, a journalist at The New Yorker, actually used for one of his pieces mm. on CRISPR-based gene drive technology – and then the publishers came back with the ninth day of creation <laughs> as their first suggestion, yeah. which I think was a play on the yeah. eighth day of creation. Sure. I like the idea of it, but I think a tiny percentage of readers would have understood the reference. And in fact, I think I was visiting my folks when I got that email from the editor and I told my parents and the first thing my dad said is, what was the eighth day of creation? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I liked yeah. where they were going with that, but I think it didn't quite it's work. Curious. And then, but I guess, you know, I think to be a little bit provocative, they wanted to keep this creation term in the title because mm-hmm. you've got creation and then the the subtitle is the unthinkable power to control evolution. So it really yeah. touches some buttons, especially for readers that might think about creation versus evolution and and be putting kind of this power to rewrite DNA into the context of who's really the one that should be making decisions about the human genome. Mm. It's interesting because it's written in the first person of Jennifer yet is co-authored. And is that something you decided early on because she had been given the the book proposal? So the first, so yeah, the whole story behind writing the book, we had this interest from the agent. We had a phone call with him. Then I had to go write my thesis and go through the process Mm. of actually graduating with my PhD at the same time as writing the book proposal. And at the time we thought we kind of were already in the front door and and it was a formality and they would maybe help us edit the proposal. Mm -hmm. But um, we put something together that I think I was proud of, but didn't approach it thinking this was our chance to really seal the deal. And so the agent actually passed on that first book proposal Mm. That first one was written from the perspective of we. Yeah. And I think yeah. one of the weaknesses was it wasn't really clear who we was because in some cases I used we to mean Jennifer and I. Yeah. In yeah. some cases it was we society or we scientists. And I haven't gone back and reread that first draft of the proposal, but I could imagine it was hard to connect with the writer because you didn't know yeah. Yeah. who are you actually hearing from. Um so when we revised the proposal, you know, I think I also, I mean, it was always clear that Jennifer is the celebrity scientist here. She's the one that the publishers, the agents want to hear from and who the readers were gonna, are going to want to hear from because she's the one 
widely seen as the co-inventor of this technology. Mm. So, you know, it was important to me to not get involved in a project where I'm going to be a ghostwriter that's not even on the front cover. But it was clear from the beginning of the project that I would be the one helping to do a lot of the legwork and authoring the book, but that this is Jennifer's, mm. you know, her mm-hmm. telling her story. And I think by the second book proposal, which was much tighter and I think had a, a more clear target audience and a much more clear voice, we decided it really makes more sense for me to write this in Jennifer's voice. And as we talked about in the prologue, I mean, I'd say 99% of the ideas and the opinions of the book are really shared between the two of us because we think Mm. very (laughs) much alike on a lot of the different issues that we get into. But there are also things that are about Jennifer's life or about her getting in touch with Emmanuel and starting this project. And I wasn't on that first cast nine paper. So it really made more sense to, to tell the story from her perspective and explain in the prologue why we went with that um, decision. Well, you know, I think the idea of interviewing people is, is great. And when you get tenured, maybe you should do that. I would, you know, I, I really had, I, I had lofty aims to do, to write a book in the style of Horace Judson, the eighth day creation. And, and the cool thing is I know, I know virtually all the people in the CRISPR field that were involved since the beginning. And, you know, one thing the book I think didn't succeed in doing is celebrating everyone's contributions in the way that mm-hmm. I think you read the eighth day of creation and a, you feel like you're there and you can really reset your expectations for what was DNA. What did DNA mean to people yeah, sure. in the 1930s? And I think it'd be, it'd be cool to try to put people in the mindset of what did people think about CRISPRs in 2005 when you could just, didn't take it for granted that, of course, that's what they're doing. Of course, Cas9 makes double-strand breaks and target DNA. And I think there's there's a lot of fun little vignettes for sure. involving all the different totally. researchers. And it'd be fun to write that book. Um, at the moment, though, I'm trying to more. I'm kind of more focused on doing science and, and getting sure. tenure. But yeah, maybe maybe someone will write that book. You know, I mean, Michael Spector's writing a book, and there'll be other books yeah, out there. Be. But you know, you go to meetings, you can bring a little recorder and just take a half hour and sit down with someone and just archive all this stuff. And then at some point in the future, you'll have it. It doesn't have to be all done at once. That's a the, good point. The interviewing can be done, you know, whenever you're at a meeting and there's somebody new there, you take half hour and you could spare that, you know, and you don't even have to have a plan. You just get have everybody, a, yeah. talk to everybody. And then later, you know, you could put it all together. One of the really good science books is by a guy here, Siddhartha Mukherjee. Of course. Right? The emperor of all maladies. Mm-hmm. He did that when he was a resident. Yeah, I don't right. understand that. I actually met him my, my first <laughs> or second week here. It's funny. I was uh, having lunch with Utia Basu, mm-hmm. and we walked by this Thai place on 168th yeah. Street because yeah. he said it's always too busy. And he kind of commented, <laughs> oh, yeah, and I always see Sid Mukherjee there. It's so we ended place. up eating lunch somewhere else. The next day, I'm having lunch with someone else, and we did go to that Thai spot. And, he was there. and 10 minutes later, Sid Mukherjee walks in the door. And he had just actually done an event in Berkeley with Jennifer, I think a week or two before that. So I had never met him. I'm still kind of in awe of the guy because of his it's amazing, right? Yeah. His research, his his clinical work, and of course, his, his two books now, one of yep. which won the Pulitzer Prize, I think. Yeah, right? The Emperor won yeah. the Pulitzer, yeah. But um, yep. yeah, so I went up and introduced myself, and he remembered – my name at least. And then we had a meeting in his, in his office a couple of weeks later. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how you could do that while you're <laughs> a resident. That kind of blows my mind. Yeah, I had a hard enough time crazy. writing a book when I was yeah. doing that full time. Let me just ask you one more series of questions, which have to do with the, your subsequent career. So you, you mentioned that you needed a break and the book was one way to do that. But what were you thinking long term? You, you went to Caribou, but were you thinking about that when you were writing the book or when did that come into play? You know, I don't know if it will make me look bad to not talk about having had a vision from no, the beginning, but, all. but the truth <laughs> is, um, you know, in grad school, pretty much up through the end, I was still dead set on becoming a PI mm-hmm. in academia and mentoring students. I mean, that was, that's been my passion since, starting research in Rubin's lab as an undergrad. Then the book felt like, okay, it's a slight risk because 
that's not a typical thing on the CV of, of professors, but I thought I'll never have an opportunity to write a book like this and get paid to do it. You know, I, mm. other people write books, but I mean, I had the benefit to do this with Jennifer and she was someone that publishers were more than happy to pay to author a book like this. So I kind of thought it's a risk for my career, but, but that opportunity may never present itself again. And then the plan had been start a postdoc right after I'm done, or maybe apply to some of these faculty fellows programs but truthfully, finishing the book was a major challenge for me. And I think I knew six months out that there's just no way that I can mentally balance mm. finishing this manuscript and also answering this question of what I'm going to do next and who I'm going to do it with and where I'm going to move to. And so in the end, I got to September of 2016. Was it 2016? Yeah. And I just didn't really have a plan. I just had the manuscript finished. And then I thought I've got to figure out what's next now. And I didn't do it in advance, but that's fine. And so Caribou was a, a company that I'd already talked with before the book project about potentially working at. Um, I knew the CEO really well because she had worked in Jennifer's lab. I'd already had a bunch of meetings over there. And so it was something that had been in the back of my mind as a potential position. I wouldn't say that I was passionate to explore a life in industry, but I was in back in Berkeley at the time. I thought I've, I'm curious about industry. I would be able to stay in Berkeley. Um, I'd be able to get back into the lab as fast as possible, which is something that at that point I was done with mm. the whole living the life of the author, like waking up and sitting at a computer all day. I wanted to be back at, at the bench. And um, yeah, I just thought this is this is a good next step. It's not necessarily my passion in life to be at a company, but let me start and figure out the rest mm -hmm. afterwards. So then I started there. And in the month before I, or maybe the few weeks before I started, I thought I had a bunch of phone calls with advisors and friends. And I decided I'll apply for faculty positions mm -hmm. that same fall, having kind of skipped the traditional postdoc, but there might be, little to lose to just put some applications out there. I had the fortune to to kind of get a lot of work done when I was in Jennifer's lab and riding the CRISPR gravy train. I mean, certainly helped with that. So I thought, let me, let me see if anything bites. So I sent out, um, so I started putting together a research proposal, sent out a couple dozen applications and then was really thrilled when, um, when I got the offer at Columbia, because I think, not only is this a great place for me academically and intellectually, but having spent six months of my PhD working on this campus and having been here as an undergrad, you know, I really feel like I have a community here that preceded my arrival as a professor. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice to work somewhere where you have connections, you know, some people. I knew that I love New York. So it just actually felt like the perfect place for me to come back to. So at uh, Caribou, were you? Working independently, more or less? So I was a group leader of the technology development yeah, team. Cool. Um, so I, when I joined, it was maybe 40, 45 people. Um, so I had some people on my team. Actually, one of the interns that I worked really closely with um, is now in my lab as a lab manager, and she'll be starting the PhD program next month. So what I really liked about Caribou was that it was still someplace that I could work closely with with people, mentor people, um, so I had a, a team of a couple, maybe four or five people. I had kind of the main project that I was leading, but I was involved mm -hmm. in a couple other projects. And I have to say, great work experience. I love the people there. I really miss working there. And it was a neat industry experience because in many ways it felt not so different than doing academic research. I think at the time, you know, they weren't really in a position where they had to churn out some product. So there was still mm -hmm. a lot of fun exploratory work going on. And, and the work that I did there is not not so different than the kind of work that I might have done in Jennifer's lab or that sure. I'll be doing in my lab sure. here. It's good for people to hear your story because they can learn. You don't have to do the traditional postdoc, right, to have a career. You can do other things. I always tell people, try and work out of the box, you know, do yeah. something different. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think looking back, I'll be, I feel happy that I didn't stick to this very linear path that I think in academia we feel like we need to be on. It's got to be PhD. It's got to be postdoc. I mean, I'm, I actually 
kind of, there are many postdocs that I would have liked to do as well. And <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, one thing I want to keep doing is always keep on learning. So I feel like while starting the lab, I still want to figure out a way to do postdoctoral research by just teaming up with different people. Cause I think it's, yeah. you know, it's always fun to, to keep on learning new things. Well, now you have what is uh, a dream of many scientists. You have your own lab and academic place, good place. Welcome by the way. <laughs> and uh, you can spend the rest of your life doing multiple postdocs and living vicariously through, through your postdocs. That's right. All right. That is TWIM184. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIM. If you listen on a phone or tablet, which is what most people do, you use an app, you can search for TWIM. Please subscribe. It helps us. If you subscribe, it helps our numbers. If you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for the different ways you can do that, including a Patreon account. And of course, if you have questions and comments, please send them to twim at microbe.tv. Sam Sternberg is right here, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. He's on Twitter, SH Sternberg. We'll put links to his websites in the show notes. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Appreciate it. It's a lot of fun, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support of TWIM and Ray Ortega for technical help. Music is by Ronald Jenkins. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.